I'm from the National School of Government and I'm going to be chairing the session this morning. To introduce you to the panel, uh, first of all, um, on the right is Annabelle Turvey. And Annabelle is uh, working in the Office of Civil Society in the Cabinet Office and she's working on the Big Society. Um, we then have Mark Davis, who's a director from the Department of Health, and um, he works in the Department of Health on the Big Society and Health Inequalities. Um, next to Mark is Professor Peter Marsh from the Mutual Task Force, Mutual's Task Force, and then right at the end, we've got Kate Lothrop, who's Chief Executive of a social enterprise um, called Hillholt Wood, and uh, Karen Lothrop, and she's a director of um, a social enterprise coalition. Um, the format for the day is that um, it's every speaker is going to talk for 10 minutes, and that should leave us plenty of time at the end for Q&A. Um, and we do, we'll finish uh, promptly at half past, and I'll be signaling to all the speakers that they've got two minutes left, because I'm sure they've got tons to stay. So uh, I'm now going to hand over to Annabelle who is going to talk us through the policy aspect. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've spoken about big society and what is it and what it means in a number of different environments, so in a prison, to business leaders, to fast streamers, and I start rather masochistically with a question about, can you put your hand up if you can describe the three pillars of big society? Okay, I think one person put their hands up. That's great, because if you go away from here knowing what the three pillars of big society are, then I consider that a win. But I think it's also quite interesting about big society. What is it beneath the brand? What does it mean? What do we need to be thinking about as policymakers? So I wanted to do a bit of setting the scene about what it is and what it means. So, what is big society? David Cameron starts with a vision statement. Big society is a vision where people in their everyday lives don't always turn to officials, to local authorities or central government for answers to the problems they face, but instead feel both free and powerful enough to help themselves in their communities. And that's great, but it is visionary. So we now need to think about what are the three pillars. I need to find another way because I think they're more concentric circles and pillars, but bear with me. Imagine these are pillars. What are the three pillars? So, I want to start at the bottom one, social action, which is really, in a way, the new default, which is saying, what is it that people can do for themselves and want to do for themselves and are actually better placed than other people do for themselves? They may still need help. That may be financial help. It may be regulatory help. It may be they need buildings. But actually, they know what they care about and they're willing to do something. Then it's about open public services, where there is a role for government and there is still a massive role for government, what's the best way to do it? Whether that is co-production or co-design, so really letting go of some of the ownership of policies and actually seeing what do policies look like if people start designing them. There may still be a role for government, but actually how would people think about this? How would organisations who are already doing things think about it? But where we're still providing public services or funding public services, how can we have public services that are more diverse, where there's more competition, where there are a range of providers from business, from the community, from voluntary and voluntary organisations, from mutuals, people in the public sector who maybe have spun out and are doing, think they can do a better job and are willing to give it a go. And then we get to community empowerment, which in, in my view is a kind of nuts and bolts. So it's saying, well, actually, if you want people to be able to do more things and take more action and, and sort of care about things, and you want to actually be able to make sure that services are relevant, tailored to people and are giving them the best, what do you have to do to push power down to give people rights so that they can actually get on and do things? So what's the landscape where power sits at the place where people can actually use it, where resources can follow decisions, where communities can take up rights. So it's about the nuts and bolts. So that's the three of them. And I wanted to give a little bit of an example under each, just to make it a bit more real. So in social action, it's about saying, well, actually, 
the pr a couple of programmes that Cabinet Office are running, the National Citizen Service. So that's about saying, actually, can we get this year 11,000 16-year-olds who are actually doing quite an intensive bit of citizen service, working across groups and actually helping to solve problems that they wouldn't otherwise get involved in. For us, it could be the civic service. So actually, what are we doing in our departments to actually volunteer and get out? It could also be what can we do, what can government do to help people give more? So the giving white paperwork we've done, so giving of time or money. Under community empowerment, the transparency agenda is very interesting here. And I think crime maps are a very interesting example of the transparency agenda actually changing people's understanding of where decisions are taking, taken and what they need to do. So in the crime maps, the government published, central government published the crime maps, and when you look at it and you look at your street and you think, well, I'm not happy about that, you realise you can't go back to central government and say, can you sort my street out? It just doesn't work like that. So where can you go? Where can you start thinking about it? And actually that gets people understanding who they need to be speaking to, where the decisions are taken at the local level. You've also got elected police commissioners there. You've got community organisers. So people who are going to, 5,000 people who are going to be going into communities to help them get, think about what they want to do and get some assets and get some help in there. And under open public services, you've got examples like community budgets that DCLG are running. You've got payment by results, actually new ways of funding things. So government still is absolutely funding services, but it's thinking about actually on a load of issues, central government intervention hasn't always been the most effective. We know that. So actually, why don't we try and see how we can get people moving away from focusing inputs, how many things are happening, outputs, how many training places have I delivered, to outcomes and actually paying people on the back of it. It could be a really powerful uh, change, driver of change, and then opening up public services, so diversifying supply of public services. I want to talk just for one minute about some of the rationale behind this. And I think there's two interesting things to bear in mind here is this government clearly believes that in some cases the state has overextended itself and that has led to an erosion of personal and social responsibility. Not for all groups, not on all issues, but on some things people look to the state far too readily. They also think that the state doesn't have all the answers. And I would say that in most colleagues I speak to across Whitehall, there are some issues where people say we've been trying for years, for decades, to fix things. And we may stop things getting worse and we shouldn't think that isn't a small issue, but are they really getting better? So I think, I think, I hope that people in this room can sort of, that can resonate. And the state isn't always cost effective. There's work that DWP are doing in the ageing society strategy. And I think that's an interesting example of government intervention tends to be quite clunky, whereas neighbours looking out for each other can actually mean people can stay in houses a lot longer and a lot, in a lot more cost efficient way. But there's also what we actually want from our society. And there's an awful lot of evidence from the last 10 years, the last 20 years, that, people, that when people trust each other, when they feel more connected into their community, whether it's a physical one or a virtual one, and when they feel in control, that actually they feel happier. And remember, the PM has put well-being at the heart of what this government should be doing, but also that it makes things work easier. So it's actually cheaper to do things. The cost of things uh, becomes less. Um, what does success look like? Let me just, first of all, do a caveat. This is not a performance, me performance measurement framework. Nobody is to think this is a performance measurement framework. But what we are trying to do is say, okay, well, so what? Big society, it's still quite vague, even after my explanation of the three pillars. I'm sure there are people going, aha, but so what? So we've tried to think about, actually, what does success look like and what control do we in government have over it? And what do other people need to be thinking about? Because otherwise, we'll be, we'll be falling back into the trap of assuming that we can fix everything and assuming that we've got all the answers. So we've been thinking about what are the reforms that we need to do right at the top? What are the structural things we need to do so that power gets pushed down, so that people can actually give more time and money so that public services can be diversified. And actually, so that might be an example of free schools, or it might be the community rights that DCLG, DCLG, DCLG are doing. It might be the ageing society work that DWP are doing. And that's great. And there's a lot that's in government's control there. It's bits of the infrastructure we're changing. It's institutions we're putting in place. It's power that we're pushing down. 
What's interesting is when you move to the behaviours and the attitudes. So the behaviours, well, what are the differences in what people or organisations do and how they're doing it that we would like to see? So that are people giving more time? We've got some ideas for how they can do it, but actually what's happening? Are people giving more time? Are we seeing more entrants entering public service provision? Are we seeing that more voluntary organisations are actually able to get involved in payment by results, which can be challenging? Are we seeing more mutuals? You know, are we actually seeing that things are changing on the ground? So that's almost your outputs. And then, interestingly on that, you can see that your level of control starts to shift a little because in the reforms, it's up to us. Do we make free, put the legislation in place that makes sure, make sure free schools can happen? Yes, we can be held accountable for that. What happens about how many free schools are taken up? Well, actually, it's not something that we can say, right, we want one in ten of you people here to go and start a free school. So actually, what else do we need to be thinking about? What are the conditions and what should we be doing to improve it? And then the attitudes. Okay, attitude. So it's about actually what are we seeing in terms of whether people are trusting more, whether they're feeling more in control, whether they're satisfied with public services, and whether they are feeling more connected to their area. I'm going to push on. Uh, parodying a little bit, but just to give a sense of how this works out, is the old way. Take an example, something should be done, presumption that government acts. We produce central guidance and we get frustrated because it's not prescriptive, it's just guidance. But then guess what? Local authorities, other institutions tend to do exactly what we say. So it's not guidance. It does actually tend to be acted on as if it's prescription. We create a new target. We say, right, this is what we're going to do for people and they will be grateful. We set up a new quangle and we co-produce, which is really consult after we've made the decision. So how do we move to, and I'm caric caricaturing for the sake of a, for the sake of sort of example, but how do we actually start the difficult question about is this something that government should be taking responsibility for fixing? Doesn't mean that government doesn't care about it, but is this something that starts with government? And then actually how can we say, how can we let people get on with finding the solutions that probably they may already know or do? How can we put users in charge? How can we stop reliance on government where, where that's appropriate? How can we use other sectors? I am going to move on quickly because I've got one last slide I want to show you. We've done, started doing some thinking about, okay, well, what does this mean? What do you do? What does, how, does it, how does your everyday job change as part of that? And here are some of the examples of the sorts of questions we're going through. We know it's not a sausage machine. We know that you can't put an idea in at the start, work through all these questions, and then you get a fantastic, well, this is what the role of government is out at the end of it. But we're trying to put questions which actually challenge us to think about things in a different way. Should government be making the market? Should, should it be thinking about different investment models? Should government be regulating or not in this area? Should government be helping to try and catalyse other people to do things rather than government doing it and then it being government's fault if it works or doesn't work when maybe we don't know it's going to work in the first place. We'll, we'll send this round to people if they're interested, so maybe if there's some way of registering at the end of this. We've got a pack that we're developing behind this, very happy to share it. But I just want to say, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, it's not a silver bullet, it's not the 101 guide to doing policy in the big society, because big society is messy and it's going to evolve, it's going to change. When people start doing things more or differently, that will make us change, because we'll have to think about what does that mean? If people start wanting to help their neighbours more who are elderly, the role of the state changes. So this is iterative. There's not a blueprint and it's done. I'm over time, so I'll stop. Thank you very much, Annabel. I'm going to hand straight over to Mark, who's going to talk to us from the Department of Health perspective. Thank you. Um, I realise we're going to be quite fierce on time, aren't we? And those from the Department of Health uh, who've heard me go on a kind of Castro-like length about big society when I do my seminars will uh, be pleased that I've only got 10 minutes. Um, also, they'll know that I've shamelessly stolen uh, from my Department of Health work quite a lot of Annabelle's slides, so they'll be very familiar for, to Department of Health colleagues. Um, what I'm going to do is just talk you through a little bit about how the Department of Health has, has approached the big society um, over the last year or so. Uh, it, it, I'm not going to talk in great deal about policy, it's more about how we've tried to embed the principles and approaches in, into, um, 
into the department's work. Uh, so I'll, I'll just talk you through a bit of that and then finish with the lessons learned. I think there'll be an opportunity to have questions afterwards so we can pick up any issues there. Just to um, start off, um, when the Prime Minister first started talking about the big society and, the, and the, the three pillars, the three elements, we quickly picked up as a department on, uh, uh, on, 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 on the big society and thought, well, this is all right, we can do this, this all feels very familiar. So the first thing we thought about was system reform, which is now called um, open government, I understand, but also the words change all the time, so we have to be very careful about that. Um, and we thought, well, if there's one thing the Department of Health is good at, it's reforming systems. We're in the middle of the biggest reform of the NHS for years at the moment. We've reformed the NHS plenty of times over the past uh, few years. And actually, joking aside, we are everything that the big society talks about is in line with what we're planning to do with the NHS. It's about pushing money and power from the centre. It's about giving patients and the public voice. And it's about shifting the provider sector and opening it up to, to different forms of provision. So. Um, we thought, well, that sounds all familiar. We're quite good at that. Um, then we thought, we also have fantastic relationships with the voluntary sector in the Department of Health. We've worked very hard to build good relationships and to think about new ways of working with them. So we're very pleased about that. And we're also at the cutting edge of developing um, social enterprise in public services. So we've had for a number of years a right to request uh, for uh, certain NHS employees to form mutuals and to spin off into social enterprises. And I guess we'll hear a bit about that later. So. Um, we thought, well, look, this, all, this, all, this is all good. We're, we, we're, um, we're very good at this stuff, so we don't need to worry about it. And we were, I suppose we we're a bit self-satisfied with ourselves. But then we started to think a bit more deeply. And we thought, well, look, if you look at the three pillars, um, we're very good at system reform and open government at changing systems, because that's what central government does and the Department of Health has done for, for many years. But we do struggle to understand the role of the state in uh, promoting social action and community engagement. I think those are areas where we feel less comfortable. Uh, and then we thought, we haven't got some of the skills. We've talked about finance, uh, new forms of finance. And actually, we're really challenged to understand that and how it, how it works, because we've got some, we're very familiar with certain ways of financing public services. The NHS accounts for, apart from DWP, the largest chunk of public spending, and we have ways of managing it, and we feel, uh, say, we're very, very familiar with that, but we don't understand the new ways of financing and the new challenges around social impact bonds and payment by results and all those other, other fancy new terms. Uh, and then we thought also, are we not just doing what we've always done? We're past masters at rebranding what we do to fit the new paradigm. Um, I've done it myself. I'm sure all good civil servants have done this. They say, what am I doing? We've got a new government, new, new set of policy priorities. I'm pretty sure that what I'm doing can fit into that. And we kind of shave the edges and crowbar it into the new paradigm. Um, and I think we've done a bit of that in the department. And there is also the danger that the brand is becoming a bit toxic. We've talked about this as well. And what I would say is it's not about, about the, the title, what we call it, but it's about what we do. So bearing all this in mind, our first thought being that we're very good, our second thought being, well, we're not quite as good as we think we are, uh, what have we done? Um, we've taken a number of, of approaches to this. Um, first of all, um, we've tried to make sense of it. So we have developed a, a narrative, a, pack of slides, again another thing the department or civil servants are good at is, is putting things in slide format to explain things to one another. But, um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, we've also had um, a significant piece of work analysing how the big society might impact in the future. So our strategy group, right from the start, looked at the, at the, um, at the, at the policies and, and the descriptions and what was coming out of the cabinet office and thought, well, how, did, how is this going to apply to a, to a health and care system in, of the future? And we've, um, so we've started to socialise it amongst the senior managers of the department. Um, Again, we've engaged leaders as well. We've, we have a, a, a group of directors in, in the department who are, who are leading uh, work on big society, partly because what they do, um, you can, you can uh, align it with big society principles, but also because they're the people who can really start to push the messages and the approaches out into the whole of the Department of Health. Um, we've, got an, uh, we've spread the word, we've got an internal communications exercise which we're, which we're working on, which is, includes seminars and uh, and different types of approaches. Uh, I think the most important thing, though, is that we've tried to make it real for staff. I think none of this makes sense unless you can think about this 
yourselves as citizens, as members of communities. And uh, one of the things, as Annabel asked you to put your hands up, let me just do something here. Tell, uh, hands up anyone who volunteers, either with work or outside of work. Okay, oh, lots and lots of hands up. And hands up anyone who is a member of a trade union. Well, it's still quite a number of hands up. Well, as far as I'm concerned, um, and the late one, you just remembered that you're a member of a trade union. Um, we, we, um, and what I would say is that as members of trade unions and volunteers, you're actually part of the big society. You're already doing this, this work that, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, where we, that, that stem from these fine words from the Prime Minister. But actually, all of us, in our own ways, are working as big, in, in, uh, are, are existing in a big society. Trade unions are probably the biggest big society organisations that there are. They're, they're formed bottom up. They're uh, <laughs> sorry. Obviously, it's very popular at the moment, but they're, they're bottom-up organisations, self-organising, people taking control of their own, the circumstances of their lives. And that, to me, is what the big society is about. So don't be afraid of it, is what I say, and think about how it, how it lands in your own lives and your own communities. So very quickly, I will talk a little bit about the, the narrative. This is how we've approached it. We set out the, um, the political background. We, we talk about the three elements and the, the three techniques. There's lots of threes around this as well. We've got three pillars. We, talk, um, we have three techniques which the Prime Minister talked about, which are de uh, decentralisation, transparency and new forms of finance. And um, we use lots of examples. Uh, well, sorry, I'll come on to the six challenges in a minute. We use lots of examples of departmental policy and programs to illustrate um, how, the, how, we, how we are implementing the big society. And there are some really good examples. Um, we recently, earlier this year, I think it was, or around the end of the turn of the year, we, uh, we catalyzed, I think we would in the past have said we produced uh, a, a dementia declaration. This was about getting organizations to uh, think about how they're going to approach the problems of people with dementia and supporting them. And rather than in the past, we would have probably led something from the center and drafted something and shared it, we actually asked organizations, voluntary organizations and individuals to put their hands up to commit to taking action. And this dementia declaration was eventually signed up to by a number of thousands of individuals and organizations. And it's a really good example of how a central government department no longer sees the, its role or, or cannot always achieve what it wants by by telling people, by directing, but actually by catalyzing change. And I think it's a really, we've got lots of examples of that. And that's a, a way that we can approach things in different ways. Okay, two minutes to go. So these are familiar. These are our six, six priorities for transition from big government to big society. I won't describe all of these, but really they are the challenges that we are, the, the, what we suggest uh, civil servants challenge themselves with uh, as they develop their policies and their strategies. These are the questions, how am I catalyzing social action, how am I giving power away, etc. They're probably stolen shamelessly from, uh, from cabinet office slides, but they're, they're relevant to all of us. So I will start, I will conclude, as I haven't much time left, what are the lessons? Um, first of all, focus on the principles and the actions, not the name. It's really important. There is so much cynicism about big society, but actually, when you unpack it, you won't be cynical because it's about how you as citizens and we as civil servants and we as public servants and individuals and family members engage with our communities and societies. Secondly, you've got to show what it means. You use the language and concepts that people can identify with and understand from their own work. So you tune the big society to meet your local needs. Then you communicate, you talk about it. You might not talk about the big society, but you talk about the actions that you're taking. And you locate it in the realities of the lives of our staff. You can talk about volunteering, which we are, which we are um, encouraging um, to, to uh, staff to undertake in the department. Then they can start to understand how um, the big society affects them both in their work and in their lives. And you have to acknowledge the barriers as well. There are some things that are really hard to do. We, we're a central government department, a relatively small one. How do we work with thousands? And there are thousands, tens of thousands of voluntary and community organizations looking at health and, and well-being. So the final issue, has the Department of Health changed? I'd say it's in a process of changing. We're starting to, to understand the concepts and socialize them within the department. Um, the Department of Health is about to go through itself the biggest change that, it, it, that it's gone through since it, uh, we, we detached ourselves from Social Security in the 80s. Um, we're about to 
move the NHS out of, out of central government into an arm's length body. There are some enormous issues and challenges for the department and what we want to do is as we go through those challenges to think about how we can take the concepts of the big society and apply them to our work. So we've made a start but there's lots more to do. Okay. Um, thank you very much Mark. We're, um that, that's the view from um, two government departments. We're now going to hear Professor Peter Marsh from the Mutuals Task Force. Excellent. Hello. Yes, I'm indeed a, a slightly different animal, I think, in a certain number of ways, which I want to just mention to begin with, because I've got multiple day jobs at the moment, and you'll see in a minute why that's relevant to what I'm going to say and I'm just going to talk for about five minutes and then actually there's a brief video of some of the people who've been engaging uh, in mutuals to uh, talk about some of their experience but my multiple day jobs I'm actually professor of child and family welfare at the University of Sheffield and a registered social worker and I also run the university's enterprise service for students with a lot of uh, well, 300 students actually in a social enterprise as part of that. And those two things came together a little while ago when we started doing some work for what was then DCSF, thinking about ways in which we could provide the best possible environment for social workers to do their job. And I want to begin what I've got to say, it's just three slides to go through after that, by just telling two stories. One story about that and then another story which derives from another bit of my day job, as it were, which is vice chair of this new mutuals task force. The first story, the first story is about a group of middle-aged women, actually, who have formed themselves into a small social work practice in Stoke. They used to work for the local authority. And uh, about six months ago, they felt uh, that the services, the contact services for divorced parents and their children in their little region were very poor and they wondered what to do about it and uh, in the old model I think they'd have done a number of very sensible things they might have thought about a strategy for it in the area uh, they might have tried to develop a uh, council pressure on the service I don't know a number of things that they could have done in the new model when the tender came up for the contract for the services they tendered for it so now they run the service. They got that tender from Kafkas. In the old model, maybe, they would have thought then about, uh, as part of the tender, I, I guess, that, you know, where would it fit into existing buildings or, I don't know, how might they uh, <coughs> utilise something that they got. Um, they actually asked a group of kids what sort of place they wanted for a, a contact service, where they wanted to meet their divorced parents. And they then got that group of kids to paint the room in the way that they wanted and paid them for that job as part of, of that work. And they whipped down to Ikea and bought the furniture for that service. And they now run an excellent contact service for children and divorced parents in that area. All things that they were able to do because they formed themselves into a small, employee-owned, cooperative, mutual organisation. And I'll just mention a couple of factors about those in a minute or two. So they really are behaving in a quite different way. It's not for everyone to do. You wouldn't want everyone to do it, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But it's not something that's going to go away. It's not something that's going to go away because it's popular in all sorts of ways with certain groups of staff. As I say, it's not for everyone. It's also not going to go away in policy terms. I was at uh, the House of Commons uh, last week at a launch of a new uh, all-party parliamentary report. Francis Maud uh, introduced part of that and uh, Roberta Blackman Woods, uh, the Shadow Minister for Civil Society, uh, followed him and her statement was there's not really a whisker of difference between our two parties on the overall principles here. Uh, there might be about ways that we want to enact them or priorities or timing or stages. So it's not going to go away either. So what really are we trying to talk about here? We're talking about mutual organisations. In terms of the task force, our version of public service mutuals is that they are 51% employee owned by at least 51% of the employees and that they're sustainable in the long term. And they fit into the coalition uh, agreement, uh, as you can see there. Uh, 
ways to get there are various, and we could talk about those if you actually want to afterwards, but they form part of this cross-cutting policy across government uh, to allow people to do this kind of thing. How does it actually work? Well, my story told a bit about how it actually worked, that it does do some of the things which are on that slide there, that it does allow people to challenge some parts of bureaucracy which aren't so useful, some parts are absolutely vital uh, and have to stay there. It adds a new mix in really, a new element, uh, albeit some of that element is actually around at the moment, it enhances an element in the public services family. So people will continue to be employed uh, as public employees, they'll continue to be spin out private sector contracts, each have their strengths, they'll continue to be voluntary, charitable, faith organisations, again with a very different range of strengths doing that, and a substantial, we hope, fourth sector, fourth grouping of these new mutual organisations, uh, allowing people, if they so choose and so want, uh, more autonomy, uh, more ability to do their work in ways that they really feel that they would like to do, uh, but also, of course, somewhat more uh, uh, risk, which they're needing to take in actually doing it. So these are a few quotes, and uh, just leave them up there for just about 30 seconds, and then introduce the film. But that's, that's the kind of feel which some of these things have. And I'll go back to my group of uh, middle-aged women. It's a bit mean talking about them like that, isn't it? My group of fantastically, uh, fantastically lively, committed social workers, actually, up in, up in Stoke. And uh, I was up there a few weeks back, and one of them said to me, do you know, she said, uh, I've worked in childcare social work all my life, and uh, I get up in the morning now, and I think, great, I'm going into work. <laughs> uh, and I tell that to some of my friends who don't believe it's a children's social worker talking like that. So it can be a fantastic way of doing things. So let's just move on and hear some people who are doing it uh, talk about it. And if we could move to the film, uh, that would be good. set up in October 2006 and the kind of services we provide are community nursing, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, dietetics, speech and language therapy and those services provided into patients homes, in clinics and in our full community hospitals and we're also a social enterprise. Stop one and keep the other one going. We believe that the difference comes through the values of the organisation and the employee ownership. Because we're co-owned every, every employee has a one penny share um, in a way everybody's acting as if they're an owner of the business so they feel much more empowered and that means on a daily basis more people are able to get on and do what it is that they think matters for their patients and when we work with our patients um, and understanding what they need the result is very powerful. Being a co-owner, the managers listen to us here and we can develop the services as we feel fit with the frontline workers so we can see what's needed. I think a lot of people do feel that they can take more responsibility, can use their initiative and be more innovative. What I like about it is the can-do culture and I've been saying that from day one. The patients say it's different. The patients come in and they say it's what a lovely atmosphere to walk in the hospital. It's been really uh, welcoming here. Everyone's been so friendly. So it makes you feel more comfortable. Yes, it's excellent. The girls are always very nice, attentive. It's a very nice place to work. If I was working, I wouldn't mind working here myself. The way, way it is run, uh, as a partnership and everything, um, and everybody contributing, uh, you do get much more attention. Um, and that's what a patient wants. We 
we're looking for change and good change and change for the future and we're looking at making patients our primary focus but also to look at ways of improving our services even with all these budgets being cut. I feel very lucky. We've achieved a lot of things over the last sort of five years that I've been here and uh, that, that's why I enjoy it really. I look forward to coming to work and being able to speak up. You know, my voice is heard. I love coming in and being able to do my job properly and doing it effectively. Could you ever go back? No. No. Uh, too much to lose. I've worked in the NHS for over 25 years, but I have to say that the last five years have probably been the greatest challenge I've ever had. Nonetheless, it's been an absolutely inspirational job and definitely the best one I've ever had. It's uh, great to work with a whole range of people who share your values, who are absolutely committed to making a difference to patients and who behave like co-owners in a business. And to know that we're making such a big difference um, is, is great. You go home at the end of the day knowing that you've made a real difference. Some problems with the system. Um, anyway, obviously the, the the message I think was pretty well conveyed. Can we hand over now to Karen uh, Karen Lothrop, who's a social entrepreneur, who will tell us about what it's like leading a social entrepreneur? Hi there. Um, hi. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, I am Karen Lothrop. Um, Social entrepreneur is the title I'm given, but actually I think I'm a bit of a co-preneur. I'm here to tell you the story of Hill Holtwood, which is a social enterprise in Lincolnshire. And as part of that story, I'm afraid I'm going to get a little bit personal and tell you how my journey into social enterprise um, actually started. Um, over 20 years ago, I went on a blind date in Ireland, and I met this English guy on my blind date and asked me what I did. And I said I worked for a multinational drug company, and he said, okay, so you're always only looking at the bottom line. I got a bit hiffy and snuffy over that, and I said, yes. And he said, well, have you never heard of the triple bottom line? And I know there's a theme of threes coming in here from Annabelle's. So I kind of asked him, was it a cocktail? He said, no, it isn't a cocktail. And he started to explain to me about this different way of doing business called social enterprise. And I was really taken by this, um, and so much so that within two years, when he then went on to explain that he was going to buy a woodland, and I asked why, how, and can you, to which he replied yes to everything, because you will know with real social entrepreneurs, there is never a problem. Social entrepreneurs do not see problems, they only see solutions. So we got down to the nitty gritty of why he wanted to buy an ancient woodland, and he said for three reasons. One is I want to live in and off it as green as I can. Secondly, I want to show the government how you manage woodlands. Now, given that this is 20 years ago, it's quite relevant now. He said, I want to set up a community business and I want to open the wood free of charge to the public. So I thought, oh, okay, can you do that on your own? And he said, no, I don't have all the skill sets. So within two years, we were, I'd come over to live in the UK and we bought Hillholt Wood, an ancient 34 acre woodland in Lincolnshire, totally overgrown and neglected. We moved in, Harry, our son, was 12 months old. We moved in in a caravan with my stepdaughter, Jen. And this is where the naivety came in. I rang the local district council to find out how you'd go about getting planning permission in a woodland. So I said, hello, hi, Karen O'Sullivan here. I'm ringing from a caravan in Norton Disney. Within 24 hours, the traveling liaison officer came up to talk to me. <laughs> she saw what we, she saw and realized that perhaps people were jumping to conclusions. So what do you do when you buy a 34-acre woodland and you want to set up a social enterprise? First of all, you have to understand perhaps what a social enterprise is. We had originally set up our company 12 months of meeting each other called Econs. And Econs, as you can see from the slide, is about an economic community, natural, sustainable, all leading to opportunity. Nigel and I knew that what we really wanted to do was have a true community business. Lots of people said, you're in a wood, why don't you save the white cabbage butterfly? Why don't you just become a charity? Charities do huge, amazing work, but they are dependent on grants. What the big society needs, what localism needs, are business people who have got true social and environmental ideas at the heart of what they do. 
So social enterprise businesses are, and as a businesswoman even saying this phrase makes me cringe, not-for-profit organizations. Well, of course, nobody goes into business without making a profit. It's what you do with the profit that's absolutely key to what makes social enterprise so different. So Hillholt Wood is proving the value of an ancient woodland in the 21st century. This triple bottom line is about your social, environmental, and economic ideas and values. We have a three-legged milking stool. The, the community sits on top of this three-legged stool. And the three legs are all the same length. Because social entrepreneurs, social enterprises will not survive with just having a good heart and just wanting to go out there to do good. Without a strong financial leg, your environmental values and your social values will just collapse. Really important, we've got loads of different stools actually. We've got a farmer's stool. The farmers don't like when I talk about the farmer's stool. The farmer's community usually fall off the stool because the environmental leg is very short depending on what kind of stewardship they can get. The social leg is kind of usually non-existent and the financial leg is very long. But by talking to local farmers around us, we've managed to influence them to try and get those three legs all working in the same way to keep the community solid. So for those of you, and forgive me if I'm preaching to you, for those of you who don't quite still get what social enterprise is, University of Leeds did a really interesting study on Hillholt Wood. And what they looked was your, your normal business model, caveat emperor, buyer beware. You go, you buy your goods, buyer beware. The charity, Pranam Nanon Sarah, in need. Charities are there primarily to provide need. They are other regarding, they are protection, they are altruistic. Social enterprises, he discovered, were in perpetuum. They're there forever. Because the forever bit is making sure that that three legs, your financial leg, your environmental leg, and your social leg, are strong and working together. The charities I work with are amazing, but they're there for need. You need something, you go to the charity. They don't ask for anything back. Well, I'm sorry, it's not like that at Hill Holt Wood. You don't get anything for nothing. I run educational programs. I've got kids of under 16 who come to me to tell me what their rights are and their roles of responsibility. I tell them that this is my salary sheet, and I've got a little slip on my wages slip, and they see the tax I pay. And I say, I'm paying this so your mum can watch Trisha at home watching television. And you know, I'm really fed up of it. And what we do in our social enterprise is we have mutualization and we're activators. Anyone who comes through the door at Hillholt Wood, because it is this beautiful woodland that needs to be maintained for future generations, they have actively, they actively have to be part of that. The whole idea of the in perpetuum, the forever, has got to be theirs. They have got to stop looking to themselves and they've got to start looking outward. The worthy contribution in this is hugely important. They work around the wood because they are making a contribution to the social enterprise and the wood. The values that we have are very clear in relation to our environmental. We bought the wood, as I say, moved in, had a caravan, lived in that for 10 years with two kids without water, electricity, or anything. Uh, toilet training Harry at 12 months old said to Nigel, toilet training Harry, he said, doesn't matter, we'll go and dig a hole, which he did. Those 10 years have been, were really the most amazing 10 years of my life because during that, we developed this thriving social enterprise. In 2002, the social enterprise was born and became, similarly to the film we've just seen, a not-for-profit organization limited by guarantee to a pound. I am the CEO of that organization. There is an exit strategy for me. Quite often, social entrepreneurs are the founders, and it's very difficult sometimes for your staff to see a way up the ladder if these two people are not only the co-founders, but in our case, we are living in the wood because we got planning permission. We got planning permission for an eco home for the family. We got planning permission for our straw bed classroom. One of them here is shown on the slide. We got, we got planning permission for a community woodland. Why? Because the woodland was open free of charge to the public who wanted to access woodlands. 
The stat for Forestry Commission, I don't know whether you know this, but Forestry Commission land around you. Do you know who the biggest user group are? White males over 45 walking a dog. We wanted to change that. And why is that? And that is because actually there's quite a lot of perceived fear about people going into woods on your own. In our woodland, it's open at 8 o'clock in the morning and it's closed at night an hour before dusk. There aren't needles, there's no condoms, there's no nasty things when people and mums and single people and families come to visit us. The values that we have around in the environment are great. You know, everything is built out of straw, but we get the young people to build it out of straw. If the big society is truly going to work, and it's not just rhetoric, it's going to be a reality, then we need to look, and I'm asking and appealing, because what we need to look at are some very principal things around procurement. Hillholt Wood has got an impact on its local environment and it's got an impact on its local community. Why? Because we take 24 of Lincolnshire's, there's 285 kids in Lincolnshire excluded at under 16 every year from school. Now that is, you know, an indictment on us rather than the child. From the time you're born to the time when you open your eyes, not at years of age, to the age of 16, you spend 15% of your time in school. Just think about that. The rest of that time is spent in the loving bosom of your, of your family, if you're very fortunate. These are people that have aspirations for you. They'll be thinking up names for you while they're pregnant. They'll be looking at schools. They'll be envisaging you playing rugby for England, playing cricket. My kids are not that privileged. Most of them spend 5 to 6% of their time at school by the time they're 16. What the big society can really do through social enterprise is we do the nurturing, we provide that role the parents actually should be providing and they're not. So when a young person who hasn't got that family to go to finds that fraternity outside, they find them in gangs, they find them in their local community. There is a perceived fear in our local community about what our young kids are getting up to. So we ensure that they're busy. We ensure that they get a good, strong curriculum. But where we're being hampered, and again, it's a bit of a challenge, Annabelle, where we're being really hampered is that Hillhold Wood has stood on its own two feet financially, and I'll show you a slide just to back that up. We have for 10 years been looking after under 16s. Every year, and we've just had our year 11, 100% of those young people, 50% of them this year had tags came away with no less than five very good qualifications. I'm not a huge fan of NVQs, not very qualified. I'm really not, because the local employers tell me that when young people who are that disengaged from society, and the government like to call them hard, hard to reach, I call them hardly reached. If we're going to be really serious about the big society and the localism, they are just hardly reached, and we need to have the flexibility to go out there and reach them. And when you do, my God, the changes that can happen. When you see these young people coming into the wood, petrified of the pigs, petrified of the chickens, they just don't understand the peacocks. We don't even go there. They just, they have not got a clue about what we're talking about in the big society. They really don't. Do you know why? because they look to themselves, because they have to, from instinct, to survive. They're not looking outward. They're not looking to what you, 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 or you in your community want. And it is up to us as community people to make sure that they are brought into that. And that is why they go out to work for us. We do the countryside services for our local council. They go out and pick up the litter. And they don't go out and pick up the litter because they're bad boys. They go and pick out the litter because actually that's what they should be doing. The countryside looks awful if it's littered. And I keep saying my lads and my boys, I refused. My local county council said, if you're taking on this program under 16s, you've got to take males and females. I said, get stopped, pardon the expression. 34 acres of woodland and you're asking me to take girls and guys. Are you nuts? <laughs> nuts. To which they said, what about the quality? I said, stop it. Look, I'm telling you, what do you want? Do you want these 12 boys 
Do you want them to go out being part of the big society, understanding what you and I all pay our taxes for? Do you want us to give you a child who can act independently in the community? Or do you just want me to give you a group of people with NVQs that the local employer doesn't want? If you've only spent 7% of your time at under 16, I can tell you, you can't tell the time, you can't say please and thank you, and you've no idea what that little word tax means. So we absolutely break the boundaries and say, look, you know, we do it, but we do it the way we want to do it. Local community ownership and control. Thank you. We have applied the Plato rule at Hillholt Wood. Plato said, he said a lot of things I don't agree with, but this I did. No man is worth four times the value of another man. My salary cannot be four times the salary of the lowest paid worker at Hillholt Wood. This does not detract from me getting first class honour students from the Sorbonne, from Oxford, from Cambridge. They are buying into something, something that the UK needs, which is future wealth. The meaning of the word wealth, ladies and gentlemen, does not mean pound shillings and pence. It means well-being. That's what it means. We have been financially independent. You can see from the figures, turnover of 1.2 million. The Forestry Commission are in awe. We employ 30 full-time people with 25 part-time employees. We are not a drain on the government. However, it feels like we're being a little bit shortchanged by the big society. We are doing cracking work with young people that really nobody else will touch. And yet, we have to tender with the big A4Es and everybody else for our, and competition is something we're not afraid of. For the over 16 program, we could well lose that. Why? Because we will only get paid now if we get qualifications. You try telling that to a 17 year old who's hooked on drugs, who's an alcoholic and has nowhere to go. We need to look after his nurturing first to bring him back into our society. Then his brain will switch into gear and then they will want to learn. Then they get their qualifications. So very quickly, entry to employment, watch NK, some of the training providers. I show this to you because this is our home. We built in an ancient woodland an off the grid house. The only utility this house has is a telephone line. We were told we couldn't, we were told we can't. We were told it ain't possible. So I feel very fortunate to be here today in such an august audience. You all came to the civil service to make a difference. You all came because you are part of a community. I would now urge you, please, if you feel your hands have been tied, untie them, look for innovation, make that difference that you came in to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. We've now got um, 10 minutes for questions. I'm sure there must be lots of questions, both about policy, mutuals, and actually what it's like uh, to be a social entrepreneur. So if you'd like to put your hands up. Um, is there somebody with some mics? So um, I can see a hand there. Uh, uh, and let's start over there, then. And then, um, then somebody here. Hello, yes. All right, hello, uh, Simon Collis from HMRC in East Anglia. Um, I'm not knocking the work of the big society or anything like that, but I do have a question. Um, how can any venture which involves the use, possibly, of private capital, and hence a desire for profit, ever be more cost-effective than a state-run organisation? That must be one for you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, why can't private capital be engaged in this? I mean, the... I'm not quite sure what the thrust of the question is really about, I mean, as Karen's saying, these are profit organisations, it's just the use of the profit. Uh, you can have some private capital engaged in it, you could have some grants in, engaged in it. I, I don't see why, why having some private capital would make it less effective or more effective. Do you want to follow up? I mean, uh, with a private interest, how can it be fully independent and within the government sector, you, basically, if the government controlled it? How can it be fully independent? Yes. Um, well, like, I mean, nothing's fully independent, is it? I mean, the, 
each any any organization is answerable for a number of uh, to a number of different bodies for a number of different things if you take my example of a social work practice is that there is a large contract with the local authority and it's it's answerable through that contract for delivery of good services to kids there's also a small contract as i mentioned with a with CAFCAS actually to deliver another set of services it's answerable through that um, yeah, and, uh, and it's answerable to its, to its kids and, and to its foster parents and to its community in, in the sort of way Karen was yes. saying. I, th I think perhaps too, uh, maybe the drift of what you're getting is that if there are some organisations that are just profit driven and are, are in that for profit, yeah. um, th that can cause problems. Um, it can pro cause problems in the area of delivery, for instance, where when you're only paid to get qualifications, well then you will rush those qualifications through no matter how and when because your job might depend it at the end of the day. For us, when we are not driven by that, when the social outcome is more important than the financial output, and that might be where your, your question's coming from, and that is hugely important. And I'm afraid that, that, that if the government keep rounding up the usual suspects, particularly, sorry for those in DWP in the audience, for the welfare to work program, we are going to have a nightmare. If you just round up the usual circo, a free, et cetera, et cetera, you are missing a trick because you're losing the local knowledge, the intervention that we can do locally. And I think that what you know, the, the, the huge okay. difference with social enterprises and the social enterprises, the two that you, you've seen a little bit, is what we do with our profit. It can only go one way. It can't go into my back pocket, it can only go back into the organisation. Garen, uh, j just so that we have space for more questions, there was a question here. Um, yep. yeah. Hi, I'm Jo Withers from um, DEFRA. I've just been taken on to um, take forward our natural environment white paper commitment to set up a green infrastructure partnership, which is essentially going to be a bottom-up partnership of civil society organisations and other organisations that will look at improving um, the amount and the quality of green infrastructure. Um, how can we make sure that we include people such as yourself, Karen, in this partnership? People, I've seen what fantastic job you've done with, is it Hill Holtwood? Um, how can we make sure that a lot of this real great best practice work that's going on around the country in social enterprise organizations like yourselves gets included in the new partnership? Um, I think the first thing is that if you look to who you might call first, so who are you going to call? You might just call the Woodland Trust, or you might just call um, you know, the Wildlife Trust. There are lots of other organizations with huge expertise like Hillholt Wood. And I think at times that the good work, the very good work that the aforementioned organizations do, they're not as innovative as the social entrepreneurial sector <laughs> that we represent. So I think one of the things I would ask you to do is broaden your net when you're going to do your who you're going to call. Um, I'd like to just add something there, which is, I think one of the defaults I've had in the past, I'm not gonna speak for MDL, is I want things to suit me. I want people to go into groups that I can interact with really easily. And mm. if they've got a sector and they've maybe got a hierarchy and I can go to one person, all the better and I think we're in a different world now and it is actually about how much are we looking outwards and I was serious about co-production co-design I think in general massive generalization we've been mouthing co-production and co-design and what we've been doing is consulting on what we think the answer is and I think how much are we looking out how much are we actually stretching ourselves to en engage with the people who no offence, Karen, will be tricky for us. <laughs> sort of, are. How, how are we doing that? <laughs> and that's very uncomfortable, and it's very uncomfortable culturally. Will we get rewarded for it? What are we doing to, in the civil service to think about how we're rewarding people who are doing things in a different way as well? So I think there is something about our own cultural bias there. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, this lady. Hello, I'm Jo from the Skills Funding Agency. Um, one of the things I... I mean, my job as an inclusion advisor, I think about, is something like social enterprise. You're talking about removing guidelines, but at the same time, rather than being prescriptive, is it possible you need some sort of ground rules supporting developing the social enterprise? You need to be able to share good practice like the woodland, like the woodland that's been described to us. Um, and how is that going to happen without some sort of central, I don't mean control, 
but central general guidance. I think that's one. It, if you like. Thank you. I think that's one for Annabelle. Um, I think. I think that's a really good request. I would go back to my cultural bias point, is, point, which is it's a really good request, but we need to be so careful in responding to that request to not look, at, look like we are pre being prescriptive, because that's been the relationship for so long. I think we need to be ultra careful of it. We're actually doing work in OCS at the moment around a social investment strategy and working quite closely with departments who are actually trying out some of the new models to look at what works, what doesn't. We also work very closely with the Social Enterprise Coalition and Partnership. So there's a lot of work going on there. I think we need to do more to, to work with departments because there's a lot of really interesting things going on, but we're not yet joining up the dots and saying to people, OK, payment by results, here are three interesting pilots which are taking different approaches. You need to be aware of these because you could be thinking of them in your area, or here are different uh, sort of financial mo uh, sort of tools and, and rules that we're using. So I think we're, we're, we're working in that at the moment, but I do think we need to be really careful because central government, when it gives guidance, ends up, it ends up being the parameters of what people can and can't do, and it narrows down very quickly. So, um, I'm afraid I think we've, we've actually got to finish there because we are already over time. So can I just ask you to thank the speakers?